The Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello everybody and welcome to your latest Liverpool Blood Red Podcast. I'm your host Christian Walsh. I'm absolutely delighted to say I am joined with the Liverpool correspondent, both home and away, and pop world regular, <laughs> James Pearce. How are you, James? Very good, Chris. How are you? You okay? I'm not too bad. Did you end up in pop world last night? No, no. I was tempted, but um, with an early start today and, and doing the school run, I thought I'd better be good and uh, went back home and, and watched the game again instead. Do we want to just explain to any listeners who <laughs> aren't uh, regulars to the Liverpool nightlife <laughs> about what we're on about here? <laughs> And then well, we you can probably call it a day because that's all we need for Chris, I think you you know more about Pop World than I do. I do. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's how how would you best describe it as it's a nineties like bar in the Liverpool city centre? And yeah, it's an eclectic mix of uh, yeah. people in on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I suppose. It's open yeah. seven days a week. I'm not selling it to anybody. <laughs> um, you have got shares in it. Yeah, I've got, yeah, exactly. Slid into the DMs today. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's a wonderful place, isn't it? Where, which plays, you know, such hits as Backstreet Boys, <laughs> Moana. Bit of Chesney Hawks. Chesney Hawks, it's exactly... I mean, it does what it says on the tin. Pop world. It is. Pop, pop, yeah. It, it's almost like a, a, an adjective now, isn't it? It's just yeah. Sort of, it is it, it tends is. to be where an Echo Night Out ends up, doesn't it? Yeah, when it gets a little the, bit heavy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I was... I was in there a couple of Saturdays ago, and uh, yeah, I didn't realise at the time that they must have had a, a pop world uh, snapper going around taking pictures of people. And the uh, the yeah, new James, you look quite happy to be on that <laughs> picture. <laughs> that was the Peroni smile. <laughs> <laughs> a five pound a pop. Um, so no pop wheel for you. Any pop wheel for my other guest, uh, Kiva O'Neill? Now with the Echo full time. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Yeah. Um, Pop world always, yeah. Always, I mean, like... it's one of them you don't really want to, but you do, and then you get pictured like James, and the evidence is there forever. And then the fear the day after, <laughs> that unshakable, regrettable fear. Uh, there was no fear at Anfield last night. Um, Liverpool won 1 0. They're into the last 16 of the Champions League, James. I don't know what anyone was ever worried about, to be honest. Like, it was a pretty routine day, wasn't it? Oh, God, it was, you know, it was a great night. Um, uh, Klopp, I was at Anfield obviously for Klopp's press conference the day before, and he, you know, he said, you know, I've told the players that, you know, as long as nothing major happens with refereeing decisions or whatever, we'll get what we deserved. And in the end, Liverpool did get what they deserved. There's no doubt that over the course of the ninety minutes, they deserved to 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 go through. It was a massively impressive performance, I think, considering the the caliber of the opposition and the experience that Napoli have got. You know, Liverpool showed amazing maturity and control to to boss that game for huge periods. Um, it was just unbelievable that you know, we, we we were still talking at the end about you know a a world class save from Alison Becker and his value to the club because it really shouldn't have come to that. You know, Liverpool, I know two 0 wouldn't really have changed anything because of the dynamics of the qualification, but Liverpool should have been three or four up with the chances they created. They were. They were so impressive, and especially second half, I thought they really stepped it up. Um, you know, you wondered whether Klopp would kind of stick or twist, um, but yeah, they just created chance after chance. And you know, I think Sadio Mane was probably the most relieved man inside Anfield <laughs> when Allison kept out that chance from Milik deep into stoppage time because um, yeah, you know, it was that was that was a huge moment. But you know, Liverpool should have been home and dry by then. Eva, we'll talk about the uh, saving a little bit. We probably could record it. Entire pod on it to be fair, but we won't say. Uh, we'll just That's talk why about I it. Come in, I <laughs> Welcome to the Alison Becker safe yeah. pod. Um, you know, James mentioned about the maturity there. How how impressed were you in, in the way they played that game in the sense of nil nil, one nil, and then the, the, they knew what to do despite the fact that it was all in favour of Napoli because a goal for Napoli would have changed everything. A goal for Liverpool, as James alluded to, didn't actually really change anything. So it was all really stacked in Napoli's favour there, which made it easy for Napoli to, to know what tactics to adopt. But for Liverpool, it was a bit of a, well, did he stick? Did he twist? What did he do? You know, how impressed were you by, by what they you know, produced there? Yeah, I was really impressed. I think it's a bit weird, the game like this, because you just do need one goal. But Liverpool, I think we've learned over the past seasons, we can't just keep attacking, we have to defend as well. And obviously we've got Van Dijk players that can defend. Um, but we obviously get the goal and then we, we don't need to score but it's just in us to keep keep attacking and keep looking for that next goal because you think if Napoli score then we'd have to score too so that's kind of always in the back of your mind but I wasn't worried until like 70 minutes and then it's getting into that last sort of 20 
and you're just kind of like then 80 and you're just waiting for like this big moment to come for Napoli obviously we're going to speak about the save and it does come falls to Milik and you know the rest is absolute beauty history <laughs> everything just the world right there um but yeah like man I could have had about 100 goals couldn't oh, I? I know I just don't know how they didn't go in I'm just like we just do it the hard way. Liverpool always do it the hard way, and Manny will get in them. I think he was probably just missing on purpose. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> like at one point, I was just like, "No, that's ridiculous." Like he he's got to score that. Well, I know you're joking there when you say he's missing on purpose. We're not saying Sadio Mane was missing each other on purpose. <laughs> no, he loves but goals. He does look, you know, but I was thinking at the time, and I don't. So I don't think this is hindsight talking, James. But. In a weird way, I think it's suited Liverpool to be at one nil rather than two nil because I just if you remember when Salah scores, Liverpool have a really rocky three or four minutes there where their heads have sort of gone off a little bit. I just think if, if Liverpool have got a second lace on, you just don't know how the dynamic changes. And in in a weird way for Liverpool, it, it was suiting them that Mane was putting the ball out for a goal kick because it was almost you know Napoli didn't have a kick off. So in a weird way, it sort of suited Liverpool how the game actually develops. Yeah, you're right. It would have been a strange. Kind of reaction, wouldn't it? I think if Liverpool had got a second, because it, you know, obviously there would have been delight, but by the same token, that knowledge that it didn't really change anything. I suppose at the halfway there, to, if it's two 0 and then two one, they only have to score yeah, one. Bus, yeah, yeah. When they get to later but, on, that doesn't. Yeah, it's still on it, still on a knife edge, isn't it? But yeah, I mean, t- to be honest, Liverpool should have scored a second and a third with the with the chances they created in that in that second half. I mean, I, I thought I thought what was most impressive was the fact that you know Ancelotti made three quick fire changes because he knew that they didn't even have one even close to getting a foothold in the game and, and still you know Liverpool their vice vice like grip on that game just didn't loosen um you know the, the control we talked about before you know completely kept them at bay and i think yeah the fact that it stayed at 1-0 probably did just focus minds that the fact that they knew you know what was exactly what was at stake and what they had to do um but you know, as Kiva said, the problem is I think everyone in the ground knew that when you miss that many chances, Napoli, despite not really ever looking like scoring, they were bound to get one chance, and and sure enough, they did. Talk about the, the vice like grip there, James. The midfield have got a big part to play in that, haven't they? And I'll admit, I think he was the same as me as well before the game. You see that midfield, and you go, "Is there enough creativity there? Liverpool have to win this this game of football. They probably have to score more than once. I mean, it didn't transpire that they did, but you know, they've had a lot of a lot of brickbats over the past couple of months, Juan Aldum, Henderson and uh, Milner. Not necessarily as individuals, Henderson has, but as a trio, it, it's certainly been you know, lamented every time that the, the team sheets dropped. How big was that for them and, 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 and was it sort of justification for, for Jürgen Klopp? Yeah, I think you've got to give Klopp a, a huge amount of credit. I think tactically he got it absolutely spot on. I think we talked about it in the pod at the start of the week that... Um, I think it was with Joe Rimmer then, he was saying that he thought Klopp would go at attacking and try and blow uh, Napoli away. But I always thought just with the way, that the, well, the way that the game was set up and what Liverpool needed to do, that I thought he would, would revert back to a more cautious, pra- pragmatic approach because th- there was no need to go chasing the game. And I think you could tell from the way that Klopp was talking in the build-up to the game about his respect for Ancelotti's team and how dangerous they're on the counter, that... You know, he was never going to overcommit players. You know, he made sure. You know, Liverpool had such a ridiculously strong bench last night. He knew that if the goal didn't come, then he could bring on a Cato or a Shakiri or a Sturridge in that in that second half. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as I tweeted out the team last night, you know, every single reply was, you know, "Oh my God, we're going out." You know, can't believe he's picked that midfield. Where's Fabinho? Where's Cato? Um, because you know. They are they are maligned at times that trio of Henderson, Ronaldo and Milner. And there's been times this season where they haven't delivered as a team. You think that that was the midfield in Paris a few weeks ago when Liverpool created next to nothing. But I think people are too quick to overlook. There's also the midfield that led Liverpool to Kiev, you know, and and that started those you know those massive games that Liverpool had in on that journey to the Champions League final. So and Klopp got exactly from them last night what what he wanted in terms of. You know they just worked so tirelessly as a unit to cover space. Um, you know, re- really intelligent with the way they they pressed the ball, the way they won it back, and they just they they were the key to Liverpool remaining in control of that game. They actually got better as the game wore on as well, didn't they? Because you know, first twenty minutes was a little bit frantic, but towards the end of the game, 
I mean, Milner had gone off at that point, but Henderson was everywhere. Van Alden was breaking forward and showing that creativity that he is capable of. You know, is this the sort of performance you think that where fans might hopefully remember now next time they see it drop and, and those three are starting together? Or do you think it's it's just one of those midfields that works maybe in Europe and not domestically? I think, like James said, it's a sort of trusted midfield and I wasn't too surprised to see them there because Cater and Fabinho haven't sort of been moulded yet into like what Klopp wants them to sort of be, where, you know, Milner Henderson and Wijnaldum are very much Klopp's players and they very much do a job and he knows they're going to go out tonight and do exactly what I want them to. They're going to play where I want them to, they're going to pass and, you know, they're not always going to have the best performances and we've seen that over the season if sometimes when Aldum's had a better game Milner hasn't played as good as he normally does or Henderson's come under a lot of criticism for different things but you know I think they they done the job last night and then we sort of seen them like Cater and Fabinho come on and this is sort of like the future and I think come the end of the season we'll definitely have they'll have more of a foothold in that midfield but we have to say you know this is our tried and trusted midfield and we like you know they've done a job for us last night it's one of those as well where against maybe a Burnley or a Bournemouth you can maybe have a little, a couple of teething problems in midfield and you won't get punished. Whereas a game like that, you do sort of need the three who are exa- you know exactly what they're going to deliver to the absolute letter. Yeah, definitely. I think that's that's why Klopp's gone for them. You know, like James said, they got us to the Champions League final. We can't forget that these are you know, good players, absolute professionals. <laughs> good players, yeah, really know. good players. Like when has been one of my favourite players all season. I think he's been brilliant. Um, so yeah, they are good players, and you know we will see more of Fabinho and Kate and the rest of them come into the team. Obviously, Oxley Chamberlain to return and stuff like that. But yeah, these are our trusted players, and we will see them throughout the season, of course, and be happy to. We'll you know we'll sort of touch upon I suppose the three big instances of the game. Then first, James, uh, we'll start with the, the the first one, Virgil Van Dijk, that challenge on uh, Dries Mertens. Now, don't know about you, but I thought it was. Just, in real time from the press box look a phenomenal challenge yeah um, you look back at it he wins the ball and the man gets the yellow card and feel it absolutely apoplectic at what the at what the referee did Carlo Ancelotti wasn't happy afterwards said it should have been a red card you know what, what's your take on it and you know ultimately how good is Virgil van Dijk you know that's what it'll lead on to because again, yeah. you know he's, he's on a tightrope there for 80 minutes yeah. he didn't put a foot wrong I mean, I thought that the Slovenian ref was absolutely off yeah. his head, wasn't he? I mean, he gave some crazy decisions. You can say over... that now that Liverpool are through. Yeah. You don't want to be sour grapes if you yeah. don't. Yeah, I mean, you know... My he... God, he was abysmal. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I thought he was wearing a Napoli top under there. <laughs> what's going on? Four, four, four games, four defeats. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not accusing them of, but you do wonder, like, in terms of how, yeah. how, how can someone be that bad? Yeah, I mean, there were some baffling decisions. Although, in actual fact, I think he actually got that one absolutely spot on. Like, like you... First of all, and like most people inside Anfield, I couldn't believe he'd even given a free kick because you, you see Van Dyke play the ball, and from where we were, you didn't, you know, then, then when you watch your replays and you think actually he has caught him, he's caught him with his studs around the ankle, and yeah, you know, you know, I don't think you you can't say just because he played the ball first, it doesn't matter what happens afterwards, especially after the conversations we had last week about Klopp's complaints about Burnley. You know, you can't you can't be too hypocritical. Um, so yeah, I think I think a yellow card was right. I, I heard obviously what Ancelotti said afterwards about he thought he was lucky to stay on the pitch and that if there was VAR, he would have got sent off. I, I don't I don't, I don't see how that's a red card offence. There's no you know there's nothing malicious in that. You can see clearly that you know he slid in, he's played the ball. Yeah, he has followed through and caught him, but there's absolutely no intent. It's a it's a yellow card, right decision, um, and you know Van Dyke spoke to him afterwards in the mix zone and he you know he was he said you know it's absolutely you know you know yes he caught him but he certainly certainly didn't mean to and he, he as far as he was concerned it was it was the right call um in terms of how good he was yeah I, I gave him man of the match I think I thought he was just absolutely immense from from start to finish yet again and you run out of superlatives to describe him really because um yeah he's just He's just an absolute leader, isn't he? The way that the way that he marshals that back line, you know, another another clean sheet, um, you know, and you know, having him and Allison of just Liverpool are now just such a different force in Europe compared to compared to last season. The Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo.